everything we've ever known, all the history we've ever known, every single Homo sapien, both in recorded history and evolutionarily, has existed on this pale blue dot. What we call Earth. And we're now at a state where we're able to contemplate how we came to be. We're essentially made up of star stuff. I mean, it's stars that make these heavy elements like carbon. They make these lighter elements too, like hydrogen. These inorganic molecules came together to form organic molecules that gave rise to us. And now these molecules, what makes us, is questioning whether or not we're gonna survive. Or whether or not we're gonna continue. That is such a beautiful thing that we should not let it go. So it's in our hands. If we don't do something now, and it has to be now, that organism which is questioning it may not be here forever. Ever since I was a kid, I loved the American muscle car. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been a huge fan of the 60s Mustang, and my, my dad's first car was a 1969 Mustang Mach 1. You know, it was, it was beautiful. And, 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 he, and he used to tell me, he even tells me now, he's like, that thing used to eat up so much gas that when I was on the freeway going to work, I used to see the fuel gauge coming down. Imagine, I mean, that's how much gas, you know, fuel they used to burn. So someone like me who loves the American muscle car is now driving a Toyota Prius. My name is Paul Nargisian. I am a professor of biological sciences at California State University, Los Angeles. And I also teach a few of the upper division elective courses, one of which is global climate change. In nature, we have ecosystems, right? Living things and non-living things within a certain environment. But humans have created something called an agro-ecosystem where we are in, quote, control of that system, meaning we put in the living organism or organisms and we control what abiotic factors go in, meaning minerals, nutrients, water, all the non-living stuff. Because we have done that, we've created these things called monocultures, right? So we have mono meaning one. So we have one culture, one population of corn, let's say, or we have one population of soybeans. And what we're seeing is that we were relying on certain aspects of the natural environment, we were talking about water, rainfall, to help with our monocultures, with our agroecosystem, you know, how much water we provide, how much water nature ha helps us in providing. Because our population centers have also increased, because we rely more on agroecosystems, because we now, you know, purchase food which comes from monocultures, which is all great. If we get a shift in climate, which then causes a shift in the water cycle, that can affect how much food we have available. At the end of the day, people really are affected when it hurts their bottom line and it affects their pockets, when they have to feed their families. And when you start seeing that climate change is taking a toll on nature, which then affects our agroecosystems, then that starts hurting people. And that's a direct link. I mean, if you wanna make a direct link, that's a specific link between climate change, economies specifically, and these farmers who are struggling now. My name is Connor Hanley. I'm 18 years old. Uh, I'm at Chickenfoot Ranch uh, in Colfax, California. Well, I'm Jordan, and I'm doing a, an experiment in living differently. My name is Karen, and I am, uh, I've retired from dominant culture. So the cultural meme that we're enacting, the way we're surviving on the planet, the tools we use, the, the things we assemble, are potentially flawed because what I would suggest to people is the giant world we live in, the cultural reality, the stew, is not tasty. I'm choosing to use my white privilege, my American white privilege, in a radical way. Because we get, I think, 
told to be blind to the wild freedom around you. You get told that you have to work to get food, and food is this particular thing, and it's all locked up. And you can only, the keyhole is a dollar sign, and that's how you get into the food closet. And, and because of that simple transaction, everything else snaps into place. I need food, I must buy food. I'm just here because I, I wanna grow my own food. Um, I wanna learn how to sustain myself at least somewhat without having to buy into a, a corporate structure. And um, I'm making music, which is one of my passions. I like to say the nature of consumption is the consumption of nature. And we're consuming nature. It's a big ass pie, but we're moving through it really quickly. And everything we do now to survive is like compensating, coping. Walmart is coping, everything is coping. Try to find the creature born wild and free in me, but taught that I wasn't by a culture that has as its main driver the death and destruction of everything. This is an attempt to sort of not give an answer to the question because I couldn't do that and we can't do that, but submit some more evidence and testimony into a trial that is ongoing about humanity, about civilization, about culture, and about food. Keep a quick lip, last moment, grass composed. You've rolled over skin, then to deep as such for some closure. The show's over, credits are rolling, you can all go home. This might have make oil to drill, if not a platinum. Let's eat a 4x4 four four that's pumped full of estrogen, raised on Monsanto grass, cause Papa Gub said it was good for him. And good for you, sir, too. Just like the fountain of youth, who the fuck wants Mickey D's to go and spill the truth about their cancer nuggets and the tuberculosis problem? Miss America don't, cause she's the one who funds it. What about these fracking rigs all up in the water table? If we bitch about the drought, they turn our taps on just flambeous. And if you're tuned in, Listen up to what I'm saying, we got a freedom in our planet that needs saving. Cause if society's doomed and all opt out of adopting the label upon myself, I'm a human being, I matter on this earth, so I'll preserve the truth with my blood and the dirt. Yeah, 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 with my blood and the dirt. Yeah, yeah. As an advocate of tax evasion, Al Capone captivating fundamentals greater than the day-to-day -day shit. I got some fears for you to play with the bigger picture outside the frame of mind. Behind the curtain like the Dr. Oz regime, just another Ponzi scheme. Just like public education, flip the coin and pick a side, but it's got more than two faces. Indoctrination, intravenously, straight into the blood, apply the dose liberally. Are you feeling me? The stress is straight killing me. Just assure me that I ain't the only one feeling these feelings, please. When will the drilling cease? Won't kids starting books again? Will we realize we've amended a constitution to death that what we've been preaching is called Partisan crystal meth that the next generation's a bunch of hoodlums skill and petty theft and that we've no petty left All of our humility's gone Had to make room for nuts cause we decide to go and drop some bombs Sis and spare me your qualms I don't want pity parties I want to store this planet with a freedom loving army So bear your arms and stand beside me in our might We will rise like giants with love for life and for ourselves We'll crush all that defies us If society's doomed and all opt out Of adopting their label upon myself I'm a human being I matter on this earth And I'll preserve the truth with my blood and the dirt yeah 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 with my blood and the dirt yeah yeah thank you very much i ran across a quote somewhere that said you're considered rich by global standards if you can take a hot shower. And that really like resonated with me because I it just, I went like, wow, like we so take for granted just the ability to, you know, turn on the, turn that faucet and you have hot water. And how many people really of the 7.2 billion of us on the planet, how many actually have that luxury? We got rid of the propane. And so that meant the hot water heater went and um, then spent six months learning how to live without it. We have largely as many perennial foods as we can and foods that will reproduce happily if they're annual. So a long time ago, we as a species started using annual plants exclusively as our food source because of how rapidly we could uh, evolve that plant. You, could, you were committed for a year, if it went right, you could take that the seeds from that plant and continue to propagate it. If it didn't go right, you could move away from it quickly versus plants that grow over three, four, five year cycles or grow for 10 years before they reach maturity and start offering great abundance. And so that short cycle kind of living that I think is evidenced in everything we do with, you know, 
throwaway containers exists in the agriculture footprint as well. So here we don't want to grow what I call poodle foods. They're too sensitive, they're too delicate, they're based on living a kind of a lifestyle that allows us the luxury to, to grow foods that require a lot of food, a lot of water, a lot of time and care and attention, and a lot of defense against the natural world. We've been here for three years. This was our, um, our kind of eject out of dominant culture, um, cashed out every everything that we had retirement funds all that much to you know my parents like warnings against such but i said i have this money and it's sitting in these funds being invested in fossil fuels and <laughs> and all these things that are keeping this machine going and i said uh, -uh i want to put it into something actually tangible and real and so cashed all that out and put it into this place um and uh and how long yeah i don't know i'm pursuing self-education which uh just means that i've devised my own curriculum what i want to learn uh how i want to teach it to myself and so uh because <clears throat> i i feel that i don't have to buy into an infrastructure to teach me something i feel like i can learn enough from natural observation um personal psychology, things like that. Uh, and so that's, that's what I'm doing. The one thing I would say is see your food. See food. See food, not from the ocean, but around you. See food growing in lawns. See food growing in parks. Try to get as close to being able to grab food off of something, a fruit tree in your neighborhood, a small amount of lettuce that you may grow. That would be, I think the best thing because we've, we as a species, as a culture have been made blind to wild food and blind to the wild world. But when you're driving into a town, you might do that, you know, that's a restaurant I can eat at. That's a good place to get coffee. There's a gas station. You're seeing what you need to survive and you're doing it like a wild animal cruising through a forest and like, you know, there's a food source, there's a water source, there's a place to sleep, here's a place to hide. You would see those things because it would be necessary to survive. And that, I think, is the doorway you have to go back through voluntarily, happily, to be able to think about the question of sustainability or survivability with practical parameters. Right now, I always say it's optional till it's optimal. Living this way, with the, not this way exactly, but with the power that we have, with the, the fossil fuels that we have, with the food systems that we have, is, is made possible by you know, the commitment we make to, to do that. So we have to, we have to you know, move out of that envelope that we're in, that cultural stew, and see it differently. Kind of a family company. It really is a mom and pop in a lot of ways. We started it for a few different reasons, but I think it's to be able to give people um, an alternative to what's currently out there in terms of snack foods. So we really spend a lot of time sourcing out the highest quality ingredients and making sure that we put a lot of uh, love into our food, so to speak. My name is Adam Dodds. I'm the founder of Life Bites. It's a soft dried banana dipped in dairy-free dark chocolate and rolled in either hemp seed or shredded coconut. So we started making these in our home kitchen and selling them at farmer's markets. And then the success in the farmer's markets, the word of mouth spread quite fast. And over a two year period, we finally started getting into big chain stores like Save On Foods. We finally got into Whole Foods this year and uh, that's prompted us to want to expand to their, all their locations because they're nationwide and also in the States. So that's prompted us to want to get our food safety certifications and uh, our gluten-free certifications so we can enter those new markets and expand and uh, share these tasty treats with everyone around North America and the world. And we were fortunate enough to, uh, to be able to get a really supportive following. Uh, people who really care about what they put in their bodies, people who, um, I guess for lack of a better term, are critical thinkers when it comes to their diets. Um, so yeah, it's been, uh, 
been a lot of fun. Every little tear that falls from your eyes makes me want to take you in my arms, tell you to stop all your sobbing. Pike Place Market is just a market that several different people from local areas gather and sell what they have to make and also grow. So we have a bunch of produce and also like wholesome items and crafted items here. This is Chucker Cherries. It's just a Washington based cherry company. We just air dry all of our cherries naturally. No preservatives, no sulfites, no additives. And we also dip them in gourmet chocolate. And we also have some nuts and berries too. So pour it over. Stop your subbing now. Stop it! Stop your subbing now. Stop your subbing now. Stop your subbing now. I play here almost every day, but in the summer times, it really it's more advantageous that I go out and say play Edmonds on Saturdays, or like yesterday, I go out and play Kirkland on Wednesdays because I can do. I can do five hours straight. It used to be really good in the 90s, but since the Bush administration, it really has went to hell. Um, and it used to be really nice, but after 9-11 and, and Katrina and all that, the, the tips just kind of went flat. You used to almost be able to live on this, but you really can't anymore. I see a lot of guys trying, but I always tell even my sighted friends, I'm like, why do you guys do this? I mean, it's sort of a step up from selling pencils, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of a Republican's wet dream of a, of a, of a job because there's no minimum wage. What's your name? Chad. Hi, Chad. It's a pleasure to meet you, man. Here, you sorry. Too. What's your name? Corey. Corey. Yeah. Right. Yep, that's what's... What? what? I'll try to do my best. What? White snake. What? White snake. Oh, hang on. Yeah, okay. Food is running out. We don't feel it here in the States, but in many other areas of the globe. Uh, we're seeing that food is playing a big role in controlling these numbers. And actually what we've seen is that the population will level off at about 10 and a half billion towards the end of the century. So in about 100 years from now, or 90 years what from now. What happens around 9 and a half, 10, mil 10 billion? You said it, it, it's uh, projected to peak there. What happens there? Uh, food, essentially. Yeah, I mean, food, 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 I mean, food being, being the, pr the primary resource is, for example, in South America, they're cutting down numerous plots of forest. And people are doing that for economic reasons. I mean, they, they want to cut down trees so they can essentially grow cattle, um, these monocultures like corn, soybean, etc. That's unfortunate because what's, what they're also seeing is these extremes in weather. So even though these trees are being cut down, you have a, you have a monoculture, you get extremes in weather where you get you know, heavy amounts of rain or drought occurring. That wipes out the entire system. That wipes out that agro ecosystem. So over time then, the more climate change we see, the more extremes in weather we see, that's going to hurt food resources. Food resources, not only natural resources, but we're talking about these agroecosystems. That's the direct link. What we've got is basically a house of cards. Um, everything is basically set up so that those, those few areas that are based solely on mon monoculture, agriculture, like you know the corn belt, the wheat belt, the climate is shifting there. Um, the, orig the, the original crops that were adapted are, are not working. You've got entities like Monsanto and Cargill and ADM screwing with the very genetic foundation of the food supply. My name is Michael Silikowski. I uh, studied at the University of Maine from 1976 to 1980. I am re a retired disabled postal worker who also has degrees in zoology and anthropology and I'm halfway to a master's in environmental policy, law and science. We have some food growing here plus you know, one of the first things I did when I moved to the Northwest was start scoping out the situation. What's the agriculture here? What are the dominant crops? Um, how does one acquire them? How do you make do with less food? How do you make do with local food? I was out in my own vehicles, driving through farm country for 55 miles, 
every single day, all four seasons. And in that time, I watched the fauna and flora change before my very eyes. A lot of tropical storms and hurricanes and very southerly weather is penetrating into the Greenland Sea and Baffin Bay. And it's that cold air's got to go somewhere so it gets pushed down through the Hudson's Bay Corridor into the northeastern and north central United States, which are now experiencing among the coldest winters on record just the past few years. The winters just don't seem to end. I've talked to climatologists who say all global warming is man-made and you're just giving aid and comfort to the deniers. And I say, no, you don't understand. It's worse than you thought. Anthropogenic carbon is making the climate warmer and exponentially so. I can't get either side to listen and it's extremely frustrating because the deniers are saying, well, it's all part of a natural climatic cycle. Yes, but the last time this happened, there was no human civilization no major seaports to, to flood. And the people who were concerned about, about climate change and global warming are saying, if we just tax carbon enough, we can stop it. And, and uh, I'm going, no, you don't understand. There's a full blown brush fire going on and we're throwing gas on it. It's too late to tax carbon. It's time to rebuild the infrastructure. Inland, I figure it's not gonna happen in my lifetime, but in my son's lifetime, the seaports are gonna flood there's gonna be a massive change. So think of ourselves, right? So let's imagine it's winter time, I'm cold, and I put a blanket on myself. That blanket essentially traps my body's heat. Okay, so over time, I feel warm because it's trapping the heat. So what we're doing is, as we're pumping this liquid petroleum out of the Earth's crust, out of the you know terrestrial environment, and we're burning it, so we're converting it, right? We're converting it chemically from this, both chemically and physically, from this liquid form into a gas phase. The gas primarily being carbon dioxide and with other stuff too that we're pumping out. That carbon dioxide begins to build up in our atmosphere. As it builds up, that wool blanket gets thicker. It increases. It traps more heat over time. So that interplay then, that interplay being we here on the Earth, you know, on the crust of the earth or on the terrestrial environment and the atmosphere above us, we tend to see this interaction with the heat getting trapped. We're seeing warmer nighttime temperatures. So it's, it's, and that's across the globe. So it's during the nighttime where, you know, we tend to cool off and cities tend to cool off, etc. We're seeing the opposite. We're seeing that the nighttime temperatures overall are not only in increasing, but staying warm. So that's problematic. Right now we're about 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What that means is if you take one million molecules, a sample of one million molecules from the atmosphere, 400 of those out of the one million are CO2 molecules. Okay, now you might think, well, one million molecules uh, and 400, it's a fraction of that are CO2 molecules and that's causing global climate change. The problem is, you know, over time we've adapted, we, we have um, evolved to exist in, you know, a certain level of carbon dioxide. We've gone beyond that now. So humans have never existed on Earth before in this form, Homo sapiens, where we had a level of 400 parts per million CO2, ever. This is the first time that we're in that boat. And to be honest, this is one experiment that I don't want to see the results of because, you know, this is a global experiment. My name is uh, Haldor Olafsson, first name Haldor, last name Olafsson, and I am from a town named Kveragerði in South Iceland. We say always uh, where the, all the greenhouses are and the hot springs. Here 
in the back, in the beginning, we see a glacier like this turn coming down, laying on the rocks. This glacier was 20 years ago much bigger and thicker. And uh, this big glacier here, Vatnajökull, this is uh, the big, biggest glacier in Europe. Uh, the scientist uh, is talking about uh, if it has gone very much down, going, going uh, smaller, getting smaller, going down. So they talk about uh, if the climate will uh, go on like this, the, the glacier will be gone after 200 years. How are you? Fine, fine. Nice, me too. Okay, okay well, my name is Chevy. I'm going to be your guide today. So welcome to the Yokosar Long Glacier Lagoon. I'm going to tell you the most interesting facts about this place, starting with this beauty here. Like it? Nice one, right? Well, I'm going to start telling you about the age of this piece of ice. Any guess of how old is this? I have no idea. 120 years. More than that. 2,000. 10,000. 1,000? Who said? Who said 1,000? 20,000. Yeah. <laughs> we have a winner today. Uh, because we have That's your prize. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice trophy for bringing home. Yeah. Because this last year, Vatna Yokut is actually huge. In terms of amount of ice, it's the largest one in Europe. And it covers the 8% of Iceland. So it's quite big. But at the same time, it's sadly the fastest retreating glacier in Europe. We are losing it. It retreats 100 meters per year. That's quite a lot. That happens because of the global warming and that happens because of the salty water. Because the salty water from the sea, it's pushing inside the fresh water. And as you know, the salty water melts down the ice better. That's the reason why we have here an absolutely different view every day. Because these icebergs change a lot in a single day. Uh, this glacier, as the, all glaciers in Iceland are going to last for 150 years. They are going to melt completely. Then when that happens, when that glacier disappears, there's going to be a fjord here. And it's going to be a pretty deep fjord, 300 meters deep fjord, during 21 kilometers. So it's going to be awesome. But yeah, that's actually a really pity. It's a really nice place, so yeah. I had a seat in Parliament for the Left Green Movement for 10 years. And uh, the last hundred days of that period, I was a minister for the environment. <laughs> On the issue of global warming, Iceland has uh, had severe problems through the years. First and foremost, because the government was uh, not willing to believe uh, in the predictions of the IPCC. And they said, oh, if it's going to be a global warming, it's going to be fine for Iceland. We will have a warmer climate. And so they kind of, you know, try to, to, try to take this uh, this point, uh, and, and of course they didn't succeed in this. Iceland is a part of a, a global network. We are a part of the United Nations, and uh, we had to go along. Iceland is uh, a beautiful country. We have all these things uh, which Western people uh, will have. We, ha we have, in my hometown, we have uh, hot water from the, from the earth. We have, uh, we have a good life in Iceland, so that's why I will live here. What does it mean to become uh, sustainably uh, developed in Iceland? The Icelandic economy is not a sustainable one as it is today from the point of view of the planet. The ideology of sustainable development inhales that you or we who live here now on the planet, we survive, but we also have to broaden our horizon and the we has to inhale all the people on the planet. And that is, that is such a task that it, it is almost impossible for people to, to uh, comprehend it, I mean to find out what is it that we can do in order for the 7.2 billion people, or how many we are, to survive on the face of the planet. And how are we going to secure the people to come, the, the, the generations to come, that they will also survive. 
So to turn the focus from economy and turning the focus onto the planet and the life systems of the planet is the task of Icelandic politicians as well as international politicians and I think artists can help a lot in that task. I should have just left it going. Things didn't grow. They grew weird. I don't know what else to say. Summer here trying to learn how to be wild and free with a sustainable farm is always a challenge because you have to face uh, something you'd call failure, right? When you realize that your efforts are not far enough along. And other people were all talking about it too because we have friends and things who are growing food and I don't know, um, things did okay. Things weren't in balance. This summer was not productive from a food growth perspective, but it was produ productive from learning more about the mistakes I've been making and ways to fix them going forward. I'm still doing bits and pieces of self-education. I mean, it's a very incremental process because um, like, you know, you have to do side jobs and things to actually pay for food, <laughs> unfortunately. And uh, so it's been like between music and trying to get together with people who who do music and are good outlets to do my music with. I've just been working and trying to read when I can, but I mean, yeah, odd jobs. I try to fish when I can. The things that work best here are, fig trees have done very well here. So we've eaten a lot of figs and that's been fun to watch. Dandelions grow well here. Herbs of all kinds grow well here. The worst are the vegetables though, from the zucchini to the tomato. Um, we grew some nice garlic and onion stuff that's underground, but haven't been able to, you know, crack the, crack the proper uh, dynamic for growing vegetables successfully. Um. So tell me what this is right here. What is, what is underneath that tarp? This is, well, our bed. <laughs> you sleep outside. Where we sleep. We sleep outside. The comforter that's usually there got a little snow on it, so it's inside drying off. But um, yeah, we do. We sleep outside. And well, we have this covered porch, so, but it's open. How long have you been sleeping outside? <sighs> Probably like a year and a half now. Yeah. We've gone through, this is our second winter. Um, last winter though, we had very little rain at all, so it was very different from this winter. Um, we're not like trying to like, you know, pass any type of purity test or whatever. We just actually really prefer to sleep outside. And um, my dad says all the time, oh, aren't you cold? And I say, no, dad, I don't like to be cold. If I was cold, I wouldn't sleep outside. We're actually really warm. We have a really toasty blanket. And, um, yeah, it's a little cold when you get in, but hey, it reminds you you're alive, you know? <laughs> we talked a lot about, you know, what's sustainable? Can we be sustainable? Is it possible to, to do this thing? And I would say yes, but I would asterisk it with a asterisk everything with, is that only if we were able to enact a tribal mechanism of living, because that's the thing that's missing. You could say it's community, like for an example here in this valley, if I was working closely with 10 of my neighbors, some have horses, some have sheep, some have chickens, some have this kind of food. We all have fruit trees of different kinds. If we were, yes, several of them have tractors. <laughs> if we were just like simply working together one day a week, we could make a extraordinary kind of transition town, kind of permaculture village, new way of enacting fertility, and it would, it would work quite well. And so to be self-sustaining would mean um, the participant of a community, a tribe, you know, how we, how humans had organized themselves previously before this one right way to live. 
I try not to nitpick. I mean, I really try not to focus on other people's mannerisms and habits because uh, when you start doing that, you start you start building a bias. And um, I just like to think I'm I'm doing my part here. You know, I I do what I have to do to be a part of the community. Somehow we're trained to be apart and not together. You know, you have this this conflict of you know, growth and expansion, these things that people try to make, like I'm trying to make, right? This kind of attempt at a community thing, uh, uh, a new way of living. I'm a sinner doing enough to give the Pope a stroke Fuck you if you can't take a joke I think that folks who are doing that, they're well intended. I think a lot of what they're doing also can be utilized in my life every day where I, I am using less water or I am, I am using less energy. But that's, that's difficult for a lot of folks to do. Um, I, don't think, you know, I don't think there is a magic key that, you know, if you do it this way, it's gonna work for everybody. I think everyone should find their own way as far as what's gonna work, but all of us should agree on, if we continue business as usual and food resources becoming scarce, then I don't see a good future for us. I mean, I think that, you know, with extreme climate change, with loss of habitats, then we'll start to see, you know, societies becoming affected populations of people who will be considered these you know you know climate change refugees essentially these environmental refugees which cannot live in those environments anymore uh, we're seeing that with many island nations for example which are becoming inundated they'll have to move I am. Uh, I, I watch TV. Uh, I have uh, made. I have modeling ships for many years, and I'm a, a motorcycle fan. I have many motorcycles. Really? Yeah. What's a couple? Uh, the same as I had uh, when I was a young boy, uh, Honda CB750 of the year of 1974, and I have two of that. I have a. Uh, an old British bike from 1946 and I have a one Harley Davidson. My name is Trigvi. I have lived here all my life on this island, it's a little island. And I have been a sailor since I was a young boy. I've been fishing for over 40 years. And we are fishing most cod and haddock. And through the years, this has been the biggest uh, fishing port on all Iceland. When I was a young boy, we had uh, over 100 fishing boats here. But uh, now it's a 
big factories who, who own on the the few boats are still here and they are much bigger than they were in the past i'm lucky because my boat is not in the factories big factories we sell the fish mostly to england and we get a good price for it In the memories, uh, uh, it was better than it is today. The last winter was very bad. The, the worst winter I have been here on, in this place for 15 years. It was very bad. And now we got a bad summer too. We got a windy, windy summer. A few years ago, it was a very good weather. Summer and sunshine and is, uh, we, we have only a few days on this summer in, in, in sunshine. Ah, uh, yes, yes. It is one I'm making. Look at that. Ah. I have plenty of everything I need, food, toys, using, uh, I'm fixing a fuel tank for one of my motorcycles. I have to work much on the winter. This one is made for my grandfather when he was 11 years old, 1927. But I am playing myself all the summers, last uh, 10, 15 years. This is a famous guy in this town. I think this one is the f most famous person on, on Westman Island. What did he do? He was a drinking man. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good to have your own time when you're getting older. You can do what you want to do and this is very nice. I'm Ronaldo Vogel. Born, I was in Bismarck, North Dakota. I've been everywhere. I'm, I'm old. I'm, this is just, I'm on a fixed income. This just helps me out a little bit. So do you have a, do you have a hard time getting food? No, no, no. No, I don't. I go to the food banks, and the cleaners and all that. That's good. So you're taken care of? I worked when I was a little grasshopper. No, it builds up my social security. I, I usually go on, a, you know, ocean fishing, but, you know, out of my money I get, we get all oh, some nice ones. <laughs> yeah, nice. Do you think that the, there's anything going on, the world getting hotter, anything like that? The climate change, or oh, what we're putting up in the air, you could see it different here, or Yakima, it's hotter, colder, winters. We haven't had snow here in two years. 1970s, we had data that showed that we are, we are essentially causing a hole in the ozone layer. The world got together and they said, look, here are the products that we make, primarily Freon and a lot of stuff that we used to see in hairspray and other kinds of aerosols. These products, when excluded into the atmosphere, destroy ozone. So let's put a halt on it. And these were corporations. They got together and they said, people said, wait a minute, we don't want to purchase these products anymore. They put a halt on it. And we saw that over time, the ozone layer began to repair itself to the point that it's almost like it's, it's negligible now as far as, as far as what's going on. So that was something that humans did. They saw what was going on because of our doing. They put a stop to it. And over time, it was able to clear it up. We can do the same thing with climate change. We have to think about renewable sources of energy. I mean, we have sunlight hitting us every single day, every single second of the year, right? So plants do it very efficiently. They convert inorganic carbon dioxide into organic molecules, primarily sugar, to use for energy. We gotta look for renewable, sustainable forms of energy. That's what we can do as a society, as a species. And if we don't do it, um, you know, I, I don't like predicting these kinds of things because who knows what's gonna happen. But the way things are looking like now, we're reaching a tipping point. And you know, scientists use this term, tipping point, meaning if we get to a certain level of carbon dioxide within our atmosphere, even if we were to stop all fossil fuel usage in like one day, it's too late.
I remember fishing when I was a kid, like four years old, before my mother and father divorced, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed it ever since. I started trout fishing, I guess, when I was five. My stepdad, he always liked fishing, uh, and he had lures in his tackle box, and that was kind of what I grew up with. And then, I guess more recently, in the last three years, I got into catch and release, and more just die hard every day. Go, try to fish every single day, try to fish a different way. Uh, you know, try to catch them on a fly, try to catch them trolling from a boat, try to catch them like this with a spinning rod, bait soaking, just every way I could. I'm, I'm working to, uh, to get a car for freedom and a life and food. It's been an experiment, I've said before, this is an experiment in living differently. And I think that most science-oriented folks would recognize that the majority of experiments fail. We've been here about five years now and been able to caretake this place for that long. I feel like I've become bilingual. I've learned how to become much more in touch with the creature born wild and free in me, but taught that I wasn't by a dominant paradigm that for some reason we all subscribe to. It's really hard to be acting in defiance of that domestication ritual or that civilized ritual. Whatever made us us, whatever made us the thing that we now exert, whether you love it or loathe it, was collective and communal. And the physical and mental and the food systems and the things we did don't exist anymore. We're different. We've made things different. I mean, we're, we, look, if anybody needs like a tutorial on how like really bad things are, I don't know where you've been. I mean, come on. I'm just so tired of like not being able to just like fucking talk about it. The things that are all around us where there's a general implosion across the board would reflect that reality. That societally we're paying sort of a deferred maintenance price for a style of living that's, that's not gonna work. This is me just observing what's going on around me. This is me understanding how the climate has changed in the small little window that I've had, five years, to be here doing this. But significant changes over that time that I've noticed, that I pay attention to, you know, just how much traffic, how much logging, how much fire danger. I don't have to, have somebody else telling me that it's getting hotter. I know it's getting hotter, that the weather's getting weirder. I know the weather's getting weirder. Uh, a line that sticks with me is that, you know, uh, a problem properly stated is half solved. So I've always wanted to contribute to the question side. I think what I've learned is just that uh, experience is key and to hold other people's experiences against them without experiencing it it for yourself uh, is a bummer and so I think that's that's the importance of self-education it's just experience it's adorning yourself with other people's experience and uh, it's really great it's it's helped me grow a lot so there's something different you know we're raised in this culture it's win-lose that's it you win or you lose I'm like really that's it like, have, why haven't we gotten around to the point where we only win if everybody wins? And so growing exponentially, there's nothing seven and a half billion people can do and survive, sustainable or not. We can't have organic food. We can't have grass-fed beef. We can't have beef. We can't even have hummus, for God's sake. There's just not enough of enough of enough. On a scale of time that's meaningful, and you can pick what that is, a hundred years, a thousand years. When, if I said you were putting all of your future ancestors into a death machine and strapping them down, and in a thousand years, they're gonna have to pay the deferred maintenance price of the decisions you make today, you know, what would you do? Would you say like, that's not right? <laughs> if you got that diagnosis, if, you know, if you got that news, like you've kind of reached the hospice stage of things. 
what would you do with your life? What would that influence in terms of how you wanted to take your next step? People want to kind of wrap it up with a soft landing, with an easy answer, and the answer isn't easy. The answer is the same one the Buddhists would say. You're, you know, life is suffering, you're born into death. And there is a, a truth to that, but that's the glory as well. That's the wonderful thing. And so what do you do with that time? How do you, how do you live in this slipstream? What is your intention? Life is death. So we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously and we should live in the moment as much as possible and try and not to, you know, kill other people. There's nothing bad about seeing a future with the end of you in it and the end of the things you do. In fact, all of life around you comes from limitless death in creating soil, in creating trees, in creating the mechanisms of evolution. It's completely sacrificial by nature. So there's nothing bad about looking to a future that, that, that we're not in, that this thing isn't in. Then death is just part of life and you know, we're going to get through and this too shall pass. And, you know, I just want to move into the next realm as clear and feeling balanced and right as I can. I would say just keep learning, like keep breathing, keep reaching for that thing. Like if it's just on the tip of your tongue, if there's something that like you, you're just not sure about, but you think you really want it. I mean, just go for it. Just reach for it because that's the only way you'll, uh, it's the only way you'll actually like progress is just by trying things. That's, that's all I got. If you don't try things, you're stuck. Because the echo of what we do now, today, is forever and that's it and then you're done and then you go on to what comes next tomorrow maybe i'm on the outside looking in afraid of myself i'm on the inside looking now praying for death lost in the battlefield my sanity gone still i trudge through the trench filled with evil intent killed i'm ready to take lives too proud to forsake mine these voices inside my brain they scream it inside my mind won't leave me alone at night try to drink them out my head but i just wake up shaking screaming demons right around my bed i'm in a bad place see the sun don't shine right here ain't no soul in this bitch cold winter all year all sinners no care scared to die no dare life ain't worth a lot here i suggest you beware it's a fine line